Good day, everyone. Welcome to this webinar regarding sponsor role and sponsorship, the way forward. Uh, I'm Martin Sanfar. I'm the chair of the Governance SIG, and I hope you're all well today. I recognise we're in uh, challenging times. So wherever you are in your office, uh, at home, maybe in the garden, uh, hopefully not on a beach, but there you go, uh, then I hope that you get a lot out of this. So I chair the Governance SIG. Um, our objective is to help organisations to and encourage them to adopt good governance as a way of improving outcomes of projects and programmes. Because this is an opportunity to work with us to shape the role and the profile of sponsorship moving forward because it's still relatively immature. So let me just hand over quickly to my co-presenter Carol, say a few words about herself. Hi, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm Carol Devaney. I'm part of the APM Governance SIG. I worked with the SIG for quite a long time, but was never part of it. And fortunately, for the, the last year, I have been part of that. And that's been really interesting. One of the great things I've been able to do work like this. Um, and I really like the live format because I like the adrenaline of anything can go wrong at any point. Um, which is probably a bit like sponsoring projects, uh, but I also like the interactive element we can get. So I do encourage you to send us in your questions uh, and we'll get to them at, at the end and hopefully we can have a bit of interaction on it. Um, my current role is I'm the Managing Director of Sea Change International Consulting and we're an organisation who predominantly work in, in sponsorship contexts. And I'll hand back to Martin. So just a bit about the publications that are available at the moment uh, on governance. So there's four you, you see on the left hand side uh, that are the, the main products of the governance SIG, uh, in particular uh, Directing Change, which was the, is our flagship publication. Uh, the NAO once said a few years ago that this was the best resource on the market uh, regarding governance, so that's great. Also on the right hand side, there's a couple of other uh, bits of resource. So Building Sponsors uh, was a paper produced after a forum uh, last year uh, and also working with project sponsors and again both are available uh, on the APM learning module. So we're going to concentrate today around sponsoring change, that's the key publication uh, that helps us think about uh, sponsors. In addition, and i am come to it later on, we've also recently carried out a survey, an online survey around sponsorship and we're going to share some of the high level uh, results of that later with you. So the agenda for today, first of all, just focus on why is this role so critical? A uh, bit about the role. We're going to focus on projects and programmes rather than portfolio sponsorship. Look at a few models and then give a few views on what makes a good sponsor before we then uh, su summarise and answer questions. The statement here, create or destroy value, uh, was part of the forward to sponsoring change penned by Mark Kane, who at the time sorry, Khan, who at the time was the chief executive of Network Rail. And it's absolutely fundamental. They have such a major impact on the outcome of, of projects and programmes. A lot of these projects you'll recognise. There's been lots of things in the press about them. Um, interestingly, when the analysis has been done and published, poor sponsorship is a major cause of project failure. So it's, that's why it's so critical. You know, KB, KPMG review of the Crossrail project really put a spotlight on DFT sponsorship. Uh, the Berlin Airport um, project, then the Sponsor and Steering Committee didn't understand infrastructure projects at all, and they kept changing the scope during construction. If you're in construction, you'll know how annoying that is, where scope's changing when you're actually building the thing. Uh, and Universal Credit, another example, there was, I think, six sponsors in a period of 18 months which is not good stability for a project. So it's, it's important. Two other bits of research. Back in 2015, APM published their project success factors. Well, out of the 12, eight of those factors are down to sponsorship. Similarly, the old OG, um, OGC, or now IPA, uh, their list of project failure factors, five out of eight down to the sponsor role. So, Traditionally, projects have gone wrong and project managers have been given the, uh, the boot up the backside. It's rarely their fault. It's more likely to be the fault of poor and ineffective sponsorship in terms of the outcome of project success. I said I'd share something about the survey we've done. Um, this was a survey where we sent questions out to both corporates 
members and non-APM members, organisations that are familiar with the sponsor role and included feedback from main board members, active sponsors, heads of sponsorship, programme managers, as well as other delivery roles. And out of the 100 responses, 64% were at board, were in board and sponsor roles. 36% uh, were what we've called non-sponsor delivery roles, so project managers, PMO, program managers, etc. But the majority had a very close correlation and positive association between how effective governance and change contributes to successful project outcomes, and the sponsor role is key in that. So certainly there was a significant variety or variation in the maturity of responses and comments that were made through to we've got empowered sponsors, through to we see poor behaviours in inappropriate structures. Significant proportion of untrained learners in sponsor roles versus trained practitioners. And those in the trained categories felt that good governance of change really did support and contribute to project outcomes. Whereas in the untrained category, less uh, less so agreement. And there was significant variation in the positive perception between the more senior people, directors, head of sponsorship, etc., and delegated sponsors and deliverers. And as you see, that there's a list of some of those results there. So contribution of governance to project success, much more positive with the senior people versus the non-sponsored people. Availability of training, holding sponsors to account, and the fact that a lot of sponsors do have personal objectives for outcomes of their projects. But again, the, the non-senior people, the more delegated sponsors and deliverers, had a much lower percep positive perception of that happening. Interestingly, again, we've got to get to the bottom of this at some time, the non-sponsor delivery people were much more interested to learn more about sponsorship. That were senior levels and existing sponsors. Interesting. Um, but the key areas identified in the survey uh, from the polls we had, let's make sure we get decent alignment between the organisational strategy and the business needs and the strategy of the programme. Let's make sure we get a proper end state vision developed and future operating models so we can aim at that. Let's clarify the levels of responsibility. And we mentioned executive sponsor versus delegated. We're going to go into that. Carol's going to talk more about that in a moment. Benefits management and realisation and the accountability for those. Big area for improvement. And then the availability of training and competency development. There's a high interest in that, um, but it's a low actuality in organisations at the moment. So let me hand over to Carol, who's going to look at the role itself going forward. So thank you for handing over there, Martin. And I think that's a really interesting finding, actually, about training sponsors and organisations. And it, it really relates back to that piece about key success that Martin talked about earlier um, on slide eight, that support of organisations are part of the key success of projects. And that really has to include your competency or your training for sponsors. And for me, that actually starts here in being clear about what the role of the, sp of the sponsor is in your organisations. So because sponsorship often means managing ambiguity, uncertainty and integration, it's actually very contextual to your organisation and to your industry. And that said, this is a profession, so that means there are commonalities that all sponsors should know or recognise. And there are some go-to documents that, that you can have a look at and see, well, actually, where could I get a recognition or a statement about what actually my, my role is? So the body of knowledge by APM that Martin referred to earlier and sponsoring change, a, a real seminal document for, for sponsors that came out two years ago, they have really good descriptions of what that role of the sponsor is. And you'll see here that they really reflect that sponsor role is focused on the outcomes. It's that relentless focus on the benefits, the end state, the purpose, the vision, whatever the terminology in your context is that you use to describe um, actually the, the why are we doing this. So they're much more focused on whether that project will deliver a return on investment than the detail of how it will be done. So whilst they have to have that sufficient knowledge of the how, they actually own the why. And they own the why on behalf of the business. I'm just going to move over to a slide that, that Martin actually uses, and I really like it, and I asked if we could use it in this space, because it, it shows the, the sponsor, and I'm sure many of you who are listening who are sponsors recognise that, that balancing act that you perform on a, a daily um, basis throughout projects. 
because you own the why on behalf of the business for a particular reason, because it can't be owned completely in the project and the business has to go on with the day job. So we talk about the business as being the permanent organisation. It might be operations, depending on your industry, but really the business is, is carrying out the fundamental business as usual activity and the project is there as a temporary organisation to change the business in some way. Now, it is not a given that every person in the business supports the change or they have the time to engage with the project and what it means for them, even down to something as basic as agreeing the requirements that the business needs for the, from the project in order to deliver the end outcomes. So the role of the sponsor is really key here, and, and it is a difficult act, and that's partly why I like this graphic. This graphic. I hear it described as a balancing act, a cog in the machine, or a crank handle, and I think they are all quite good analogies. But there's often an additional complexity in the role of the sponsor that, that Martin talked about earlier, and that's that named senior figure who's perhaps a director, an exec, or even an, a CEO, who's also referred to as the sponsor, and yet they're not the person likely to be doing the legwork of governance. I don't see that person as writing change papers or rerunning business cases. Yet in a major project, their role is absolutely vital in being the project's biggest ambassador or rallying the masses around the, the benefits of a change. Um, and yet we talk about sponsorship as being a single point of accountability, that that's vested in a sponsor. And I think that quite often causes a bit of confusion for sponsors and for other people in the business who say, well, I, I see this senior figure talked about as being the exec sponsor, and yet there's someone else carrying out the day job work of it. So Martin had a, has a quite good um, definition in, in using prefixes, which is actually to talk about having an executive sponsor or a delegated sponsor. We sometimes hear that called a, a sponsor's agent as well. So we thought it might be useful today to put a bit of context around that, because we do talk about, well, it's, it's always contextual. And some people you will immediately recognise what that exec sponsor delineation is between uh, the exec sponsor, sorry, and the delegated sponsor. But we've put a little real life scenario in here uh, today to talk to you about. So this is a, a project that's a venture between a housing association and a housing developer. And it's going to lead to a thousand new homes being built as part of a programme to regenerate an inner city area. It's a major construction project to build the new homes and it's on the verge of, of moving from the design phase into delivery. So pretty exciting, a lot of work to get it there. Any change now likely to have an exponential uh, impact on cost and potentially puts at risk any benefits. That, that's pretty much fundamental project theory there. Now the project is a mix of new build starter homes, affordable homes and social housing. And any of you working in those sectors will recognise that that's a very common model these days. Now, the affordable homes and the social housing are actually fitted out to a lower spec internally, and that's allowed the entire project to be delivered within the affordability criteria. And externally, there are also some differences. And, and I would encourage you if, you, if you have the opportunity to look at any of these projects now, to, to open your eyes and see if you, you can see any of these in new housing developments. So what you'll find is that affordable homes and social housing, and in this project, certainly, were planned to have monoblock instead of uh, sorry paving instead of monoblock lower quality fencing lower quality hard and soft landscaping in the public realm areas so at a glance it looks like a, a single development but actually when you look a bit closer you can see what the social uh, inequity is in terms of the, the housing standard that's been put in benefits of the project of course new housing huge agenda for, for the uk at the moment some of the benefits also include social integration, increased social value, raising attainment and expectations for young people and encouraging businesses to locate in that area. Just as they're about to move into delivery, someone points out that there's actually an opportunity to collect some European social funding and European development funding and actually have the same external finishes as the rest of the development. So remove that, in that visual inequity of, of the difference between social and affordable, affordable housing. So in this scenario, what would an exec sponsor and a delegated sponsor be likely to do? And we've broken that into a couple of slides. So the exec sponsor, in this case, was actually someone very senior in the housing association. They were the first point of contact um, from someone in the local urban regeneration area who said, we know that there's a, an underspend in some of this funding, you could apply for it. So their role there is really to figure out who's going to be the delegated sponsor, and it's probably someone already appointed 
agree what the division of actions is because that is really critical when you have two sponsors who both think they're doing the same role. That is very disruptive for a business and for a, a, a project delivery team. They're likely to be warming up the key stakeholders, letting everyone know that we're considering a change here. It may have some impacts, but we're doing the proper work to assess what they're likely to be. They're also likely to uh, do some assurance work when the delegated sponsor comes back and says, this is what I think the impact is. They're going to uh, assess that to make sure it properly meets the business case and still delivers the benefits. And then their role and change in the governance process is likely to be one of support. So perhaps directing the delegated sponsor about what questions are likely to be asked, how thorough the research is needed to be. And then they're likely also to be the person who chairs a steering group or sits on a board approving change. If I move on to the delegated sponsor, um, they're likely to be the person accepting the actions delegated from the exec sponsor. They're then going to go away and work with the project team to say, here, here is a change proposal. What's it likely to do in terms of our cost and schedule? What's likely to be the reaction of the other partners in the supply chain? Come away with those impacts and rerun them against what does this do to the benefits? And in this case, for this housing project to actually significantly increase the benefits, um, so it improved the, the BCR the, the, uh, for the project. However, it did have an effect on time. So they had to work to figure out, can we run some activities in the project concurrently in order that we can recover that time? But the risk is that we can't and we need to figure out whether we're, we're still willing to accept what that time impact is. They had to review those consequences against the corporate risk and go back to the exec sponsor just to explain, actually, we might need a bit more time at the end, but this is not a time critical project and it's likely to be minimal. And then that's the person who's likely to be preparing uh, the actual change process paperwork. So they're going to be putting together the statements, filling out whatever your change control process work is, doing the warm up of some of the, the stakeholders, supporting it throughout it, and then they're likely to be the person sitting with the, the change papers, being asked the questions by the steering group and by the board. So I hope that's a, a useful demonstration of what that delineation could be. I advise that really if you're in either of those roles or if you feel that sometimes you, you're not quite sure where the delineation is, it's definitely a, a conversation that you want to have with the exec sponsor and there are a couple of resources that, that can help do that. So if you want to look in a bit more detail about, well actually as a sponsor, what's the function I'm providing for the business? What am I doing there? If you look in Sponsoring Change, they've got some really good elements in there and some uh, good advice on what you're doing for the business and also how that works in relation to project management. And really, really important that sponsors understand what their role is. Of course, you then have to take them and put them into your proper context. Now, that context might be built in a variety of different ways because there are a number of different models that can be used. I, I don't think Martin and I are proponents of anyone is, is the best. It is about taking your, your context and requirements and fitting the model around it. But we thought it would be really helpful to take you through what some of those models look like. I'm going to hand back to Martin to do that. Within Sponsoring Change, the guide, there in the appendix, there are a series of models that are shown. Uh, and again, they don't cover all situations, but they cover a range of situations um, and trying to help people to see where sponsorship fits and indeed within them at the moment we've just got project sponsor as a singular role uh, as carol said there may be a division of responsibility between an executive sponsor and a delegated sponsor or sponsor agent uh, but model one very traditional you know where the project's being run within an organization management board Report sponsor reports to the board. You've got internal, external stakeholders, project manager, project team. Model two, similar, but this builds in the idea you've got a program that sits above a project, so both program sponsor and project sponsor involved. And again, the integration with the other roles. Uh, mod model three, uh, very much uh, where there's a portfolio involved. I so say we're not really focusing on portfolios today, but again, the idea that the projects fit into a portfolio. Model four, which is further explained in uh, co-directing governance of co-owned projects, because here you have a situation where more than one organisation involved. And I can see from one of the questions we'll come to later, the issue about who, who really is the sponsor? Well, the overall sponsor in, in the programme or a project is going to be in the investing organisation. But of course, if there are contractors involved, 
then there is also a need probably for a sponsor within a contractual organization that's taking the accountability for profitability and long-term um, relationships with that client as opposed to the contracted delivery project manager, but we'll come to that later. And then model five, which is really an addition to, because it's saying, well, in the building sponsors paper I referred to earlier, there were four sponsors identified in that forum. Uh, strategic sponsor, executive sponsor, as we've talked about, senior sponsor, sponsor agent, and then also internal sponsor, because in that discussion, they differentiated between external projects and internal projects. And for me, internal sponsors, particularly in the area of business change and IT, are absolutely fundamental, because um, the, the IT world has a habit of, in theory, delivering projects that don't work. Often it's the sponsorship that's the issue. Um, if you're in public sector, there's the government project delivery framework, where there's a similarity where there's an SRO, senior responsible officer, and then sponsor levels. And then across the right hand side is what we're advocating within the governance SIG, is that we make sure we're clear on who's the executive sponsor. Where does the real accountability sit for benefits? Uh, in theory, who's going to get fired if this all goes wrong? Not always. And then the delegated sponsor or agent that's reporting to them. And certainly I meet a lot of people saying, I'm the sponsor. And then you say, okay, so let me tell you about, tell me about your accountability. And it works out they're a delegated sponsor. So as an example, I came across a major program where external consultants were taking on the sponsor role. Now me, they're a sponsor agent. They're not the executive sponsor because they, they can't have the skin in the game that executive sponsor would, would need to have within an organization. So a, se a series of models there that, again, they're not exclusive, but they do help to explain uh, the, the role. So the key issue, though, is whichever model you choose for good governance, the roles and responsibility and accountability are fundamental. In my experience, you can't ask too many questions about who's responsible, who's accountable for what, um, because it's very unclear if you just follow the normal um, hierarchy in an organization. It needs the organizational support to work well. Uh, sponsors can't be effective if they've got limited time to carry out the role and are constantly having battles with colleagues in different departments or different areas of the business that think they're the sponsor, but without the accountability that's pinned on them. And that for me is why having um, performance objectives in individual, perform individual people's objectives makes it clear who the real sponsor is. Uh, and that might be a body of people. It may not be an individual, but le at least it needs to be clear. As Carol said, the doctor prefix, so we can be really clear. Is it a portfolio sponsor? Is it a program sponsor? Is it a project sponsor? Is it executive level? Is it delegated sponsor agent? Let's be clear on which role we're referring to. And in doing so, make sure that that golden thread of delegation from whoever's delivering projects and reporting to a project manager, all the way up through the sponsorship route, all the way to the board, is absolutely clear understood and supported by the entire organization at the end of the day it's about behaviors and relationships it's about that guiding mind role of the sponsor um, and the right behaviors to encourage the teams to perform uh, and the need for me anyway is to push back against inappropriate behavior and people that are not supporting that way of working so let's hand over to carol now to talk through through some of the characteristics of um a good sponsor so what makes a good sponsor and this is a controversial question maybe we'll get some feedback from the audience i don't think good sponsorship is good enough actually i think you need great sponsorship because it's a tough job and projects are a tough world to live and work in and I think one of the things you can do is if you want to know if your sponsor is any good, and some of you might be listening to that thinking, well, actually, I want to know if I'm any good because it's sometimes an ambiguous role. I'm not always clear what's expected of me. I've got everything happening at the same time. I've got demands from the project, demands from the business. I'm not sure if I'm doing a good job. And I have a lot of conversations with great sponsors who are asking themselves that all the time. And there are some good um, resources available. So sponsoring change, I would recommend to you the checklists in Appendix 2 and in Directing Change, where you can go and ask some of the questions. So that will work for you, whether you are someone who manages or interacts with sponsors, um, or whether you're a sponsor yourself. And, and you can look through the different headings and think, am I getting this right? 
but the reality is that, as Martin said earlier, this is about behaviours. You know, how you are the guiding mind and the role model of the project is most instantly recognisable as a measure of success from your behaviours. You know, are you able to work with everyone across organisations? Can you influence people? outside of hierarchies, um, because hierarchies allow you to tell people what to do or be told what to do. They're not really uh, particularly useful in influence. And those behaviours are the absolute key success factor for sponsors. And in, in different roles that I've been in, including now, I do a lot of recruitment of sponsors. And the first thing that I'll try and look really closely at is what sort of demonstrable evidence is there of those good behaviours that I'm looking for all the time. And that, and that impacts really strongly on people too. Their interface with you on a project is most likely to be influenced by your behaviours. So we're going to look at a couple of slides that we've got now and I'm going to show you the pictures of both of them in a second. One is the, the dream sponsor and the other one is the dreaded sponsor. And there's a, a reason we've got the, the photographs here because I'll share a little analogy with you that we use in training sponsors. So Mont Blanc and Chamonix, which is in the, the pictures here, is the highest mountain in Western Europe, and there are two ways down. One of them is the Valley Blanche, which is 20 kilometres of off-piste steep descent, only for experienced skiers. You must use a mountain guide, you have to carry a lot of equipment, and you really need to be prepared for a very arduous journey across crevices, huge risk of avalanches, and some years up to 20 people don't actually survive that descent uh, across the Valley Blanche. Or you can come down on the Aguil de Midi cable car, which will bring you down across some of Europe's most spectacular scenery and land you safely in the gift shop. Uh, you might have a little bit of vertigo and you might have uh, a little bit of altitude impact, but really a, a couple of bumps on the way down is all you're going to experience. And I like to think of the dream sponsor as one who can look at a project, recognise the challenges and all of the complexity that, that will be an inevitable part of project delivery and benefits realisation. And then they choose to bring everyone down in the cable car safely and smoothly. Projects are a really tough enough world to be in, whichever industry you're in. So the role of the sponsor is to make that easier and not harder. Leave all that adrenaline uh, that you want additionally for your leisure time. So the dream sponsor and the dreaded sponsor list that we've got here are actually compiled from a combination of an original piece of work that was done by Ofgen. And then I've added to it with the comments from those who either work with sponsors or who uh, sponsor. And it's illustrative rather than exhaustive, so I'm not going to go through every individual piece on it, but I'll just pick out a couple that, that really leap out for me. And, and in the context of governance especially, because that's the this Pinterest group that Martin and I focus on uh, or work on for APM as committee members. And I'm going to pick out the, the first piece on the, the dream sponsor, which is also top of the list on Dreddy sponsor, which is about the governance structures that you create. Governance structures are really, really important in terms of making decisions within projects. And quite often those are decisions that are above an individual's delegated authority. So as a sponsor, you should be really clear on what decisions are delegated for you to make. And then you have to be really good at making decisions in, in an effective way on those. But there will always be decisions that, that are above what's in your delegated authority and that you'll have complex governance structures. They really need to be simple. They need to be designed to move decisions on. I, I have seen projects come a crash and hold while they work through these overly complicated governance structures. And a decision that was actually about £10,000 actually has cost them £100,000 in, in the delay of the decision making. Uh, some of the other ones that I'm going to pick out briefly before we, we move on um, are really around the political environment. Uh, and if managing politics is not something that you're comfortable with, then you have you have to find a mentor who's going to help you get into that space because you will always be managing the political and stakeholder environment in a way that actually you have to understand the politics and that's big P and little p politics and how they may impact on your project because your job is to monitor the environment and forecast how some of that might impact you. But you also, if I move on to the dreaded sponsor, you want to avoid the one that comes up again and again, which is people say that the sponsors who get caught up playing the politics instead of managing them actually become a danger to the project instead of an asset. A couple of other on the dreaded sponsor, and, and I hope you look at them and think, I, I see them as things that are, that are traps to fall into and not behaviours that, you, that you're currently doing. Traps that I see regularly are 
where the organisation has not been really clear about what's expected of the sponsor. If the sponsor comes from a project management background, the, their default can be to try and act as the, the project manager's boss, and that's not the role at all. If you need additional project management support, then that's what you should be recruiting. Sponsorship is again about keeping on those, those end state processes. So I'm going to move on to questions shortly, but we just want to let you know that we do produce some other materials here. Martin, did you want to come in there? Sorry, the question. Yeah, thank, thanks, uh, Carol. Just talking about those material passings around after the webinar so that you can pick up on additional resources that, that are out there. These are blogs that have been written by the C. Let's move on then to the questions that have been asked. And I have to say, there's some really good ones at the moment um, that, I, that I've picked up on. So I'm just going to take a, a, a few of them. Carol, I'll give you time to have a look at the questions. I'll take one that um, I can maybe answer, but you can chip in. Um, sure. So this, this, is, this is from David. The question is, in my experience, a key problem with ineffective sponsorship sponsors is that they don't know what they don't know. And even with training, too few really get the deep down understanding of project management and what they need to do. This can be a real problem where BAU is more predominant than projects in a business. How do you get over this to enlighten and sustain? So let me give you my verse view first and then Carol, you might want to add on something. Oh, it's a really good question. Um, good. And, and I think the focus is very much about this is a business where it's more BAU than used to doing loads and loads of projects. Uh, you can train sponsors, but how do you how do you get them to really get the deep understanding of project management? Well, my, my answer is in two, two, two phases, really, if you're a project manager. And I'm assuming this is the way the question's being phrased. So if you're a project manager, then you can sit there and just twill your th thumbs and watch your sponsor being a complete idiot, or you can actually get into helping them. I think, first of all, I don't think a sponsor needs to understand the detail right in the detail of project management. That's for a project manager to understand. However, the sponsor needs to understand what their contribution is. Uh, and as I said, in, in the sponsoring change um, document, then there are checklists there which help to understand what is the role for a sponsor in supporting a project manager, what is the role in a sponsor for actually supporting the business. So it's split into two checklists, which is, which is quite useful. And what I recommend there is for any project manager to have an open, honest conversation with their sponsor, first of all, to find out where their sponsor thinks their strengths are. I mean, I can recall from my own experience a very, very major program where I was summoned by a sponsor. It was a major program in an organization, public sector, and the sponsor basically said, I know nothing about projects. I've never been a sponsor before. What am I meant to do? Um, and I provided coaching and, and help to ensure that that sponsor then started to understand what their role was and what their role wasn't. Because there's all often a, a desire to get stuck into the detail and start delivering stuff or directing the delivery of stuff which is not really the sponsor's role. So I think the project manager can have that open conversation and say, what, you know, how do you feel about sponsorship, Fred, Susan, whatever? Uh, what are your strengths and weaknesses? How might I be able to help? I think the one thing that's absolutely essential, particularly of an executive sponsor, is that they understand the business that the project's being delivered into. If they don't understand the business area, then that is a problem, and they need some support and some help you know, what I often call a, a program conscience role, to provide the sponsor with that help and support and understanding of the business. If it's a delegated sponsor, um, again, I'm less worried, but they need to make sure they've got people to go to who really understand the business inside out. Because what the project manager needs is fast decision making at times when decisions need to be made. And unless there's a deep understanding of the business, the objectives of that business area, the BAU, um, issues that really need to be focused on, then the project manager um, could, could end up with delayed decisions. And as Carol's already pointed out, delayed decisions can cost a lot of money. Did you want to add anything to that, Carol? Um, the only thing I would add is, yeah, I thought it was a really good question, and it's one that's it, it's rooted in reality for a lot of people. It, it wasn't my experience because I actually came to sponsorship from project management, but, but my own experience was that 
I, I moved from a project management community into a different industry. So actually the, the technical and the business as usual side was the, the piece that was the gap for me. Unfortunately, I was surrounded by people who were really happy to get me up to speed in that. The, the sponsors that I predominantly worked with didn't come from a project management background. And what I've seen in some of the, the confusion that went on is that both sides made assumptions about what the other knew. So I think part of how you get over that is a great end to David's question was, how do you get over this to enlighten and sustain? And it's actually about recognising that you all, have, you all have strengths and you all have gaps when you're in projects and just always try and make sure that you figure out where what your starting point is for each other, because if you're making assumptions about what the other knows, so I would, for example, hear um, some of the project people say, I can't believe the sponsor's not dealing with this because they know what it will cause. And I would sometimes say, but do they? Have we explained that to them? Actually, is that the place they're in? Or are they completely um, in a place where they think this, can, this decision can drift for six months? Because we haven't actually said, if you don't give us a decision, then we can't move on to this next phase. So at that, move away from assumptions is the key one. Carol, while, while you're, you're on a roll then, uh, maybe you could take another question that was asked by Michael, um, saying, who is the sponsor, the project manager or the client funding the project? And that gets into the issue I talked about earlier about contractor and, and, and owner um, structures. Maybe you can answer that one. So, so the sponsor for me is the, the person who's appointed by um, the board or the steering committee in order to, to represent the governance role on the project and to be accountable for the success of the project and the delivery of the benefits. The project manager would be looking at time, cost, quality, schedule um, and client. Probably Martin and I have different views. That, that's probably the subject of another webinar or perhaps a blog, which is actually about the role of the client. Is the client always the funder? Now, in, in construction design management, it's very clear who the client is. I think as you move around different organisations, you have some complexity in, is the client always the business? Is the client the board? Which I, I think they often are. But when you work in the public sector, sometimes the government is the client, and then you have client boards within organisations. So it's, it's quite a complex one as to what the client is, uh, sorry, who the client is. Okay, uh, thanks for that, Carol. So another, just picking out another question, in small organisations, this is from Neil, in small organisations it can be difficult to identify a sponsor, yet alone a dream sponsor. How could you compensate for the sponsor's gaps in these situations? Okay, um, I've got a very simple answer, you're not going to like it, Neil, is that you have to go looking for the sponsor. If there's a lack of clarity of who the sponsor is and where the decision making is coming from, then you've got a real problem. Um, and part of the discussion, having the open, honest conversation with whoever, is to identify really where's this sponsorship coming from, so that during the life of the project, you're, in, you're clear as to who, who can make the decisions. And it might be an individual, it might be a group, but if it's, if it's unwritten, uh, or indeed if there's more than one person that thinks they're sponsors and there's a bit of infighting, you've got a disaster project waiting to happen. So for me, it's not worth progressing with a project unless there's a clear line of accountability and sponsorship. Uh, and, and I have stopped projects in the past because of that, because that you're always going to get into trouble unless it's clarified early on. So yes, I understand sometimes it can be difficult and that's why you have to ask the questions. Uh, you know, I can recall a situation where a small organisation, you know, the sales, sales and marketing director was starting to make decisions and tell the project what they had to do. And I had to stop and say in the middle of a board meeting, excuse me, what's your role in this project and that, that did actually at least spurn the conversation about hang on a second this is not a sales and marketing driven program it's driven by some other part of the business and so we, in fact what we did then is we set up a steering group where that sales and marketing uh, director was part of that steering it's a spark part of the sponsoring group but he did not have the decision making um, he didn't he, he didn't have the right to make decisions all on his own so it's worth having the conversation um, if, if it's a bit of a mess and you can't see see um, who's doing what. Carol, do you want to take another question? Yeah, I was going to pick up a question here, which is what are the pitfalls of an ex-project manager acting as a, a sponsor um, and any tips to avoid the pitfalls? And I, I was going to follow that on from my discussion earlier that I did come from being um, a project manager in urban regeneration. So it, there was a there was an element of sponsorship of what I did, but 
predominantly I was a project manager and I moved to being a sponsor in a much larger organisation and much larger projects. So it required a complete shift. And the pitfall is that when you're under pressure, you default to the level of your training. And I think that's common to, to any profession. Um, so under pressure, my default would be become a project manager. Um, and I really had to, my, my tip for that was to work with someone who had long been a sponsor and who really understood it and just have some coaching discussions with them and say, actually, you know, this is what last week looked like. This is what I think next week looks like. And I need to stay out of this space because I actually had a brilliant project manager to work with. They didn't need me in their space. But sometimes when I just wasn't clear because the organisation hadn't been particularly clear what they expected of me, then it, for me to not default, just needed those reminders. The, the other tip is to, you know, I actually did carry around what my role was for a while, just sort of 10 bullet points of these are the things that I need to be focusing. These are the lenses I'm looking through. I'm looking through a benefits lens here. I'm looking at what is what is the reason that we're doing all of this and not the detail of how it has been done on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, a, a great tip, I think, is um, I'm going to recommend a, a 35 minute online course that's currently available free from Harvard Business Online and it talks about Ernest Shackleton when actually they're taking the endurance through the Antarctic and it's got some great leadership tips on it just about having a meeting with yourself to check in on what it is that you're supposed to be doing, has your mission changed, how are you staying on track for that mission and, and that is the main uh, that I would say is the main pitfall is getting off track of what your role as a sponsor is and getting back into the project detail. What about you, Martin? You must see that across other organisations where you go in and see XPMs who have moved into sponsorship and, and you yeah, see I, that I, default. Mean, I, I suppose I'm, I'm right of Attila the Hun on this one, which is um, I've seen very few project managers um, initially exist as good sponsors because the tendency is so strong to revert back to what you know about and start trying to do the role of the project manager or even trying to be a senior project manager or project manager's boss. Um, the, the, you know, it's so, so easy to do. So I've not seen many project managers in my experience that have made really, really good sponsors. Where I've seen some very good operational people that have made good sponsors. Um, so that's why I'm right of Attila the Hun that says, an operational person that really understands their operation, their business and the strategic objectives is a, can be a really good sponsor if they've got the right characteristics and they've got the right amount of time, et cetera, et cetera. There's lots of ifs and buts there. Um, whereas I think a project manager, an ex-project manager, may have to work a bit harder at trying to undo what they know and take for granted in terms of focusing on delivery. But I take Carol's point, you know, if you're working with a really, really good project manager, then it's much, it gives you a bit more space as an ex-project manager to become a good sponsor. Um, but it, it's, it's a difficult one and there's no hard and fast rules. And I'll say I'll refer you again to um, sponsoring change, which this does give some list of characteristics and attributes that are worth checking, the, uh, checking about. Carol, there's another one here about, it mentioned on a couple of slides that having sufficient time is key. What's the presenter's view on having sufficient time? This is from Stephen. Do you have a view on sufficient time for the role? Yeah, and, and I'll caveat this by saying that uh, Steve and I have both worked in, in an environment where our constant refrain to each other was, I just never have enough time to do this job properly. Um, and I've, I've never figured out a perfect way of, of measuring what that time is. Um, when I was actually a previous large organisation, we did look, work with some, some scheduling people to try and figure out if there was a formula or a logarithm we could get. Um, and it just was really difficult because it's so unquantifiable to, ma to manage ambiguity. But I think sufficient time is is actually, you know, it's about knowing your sponsors and knowing that actually throughout the, the projects they're going to have peaks and troughs. And if they have time in those troughs to recover, then that's probably okay. If your sponsors are always operating at peak, you know, if they're always in that stretch capacity, then they may be busy, but they're no longer effective because you, you burn people out. And my own measure of, you know, when actually you're having sufficient time is when you've got time to think rather than just time to do. Because, you know, sponsors are senior senior officials in an organisation. You, know, you should be paying them well. You should be investing time and energy in them. And you'd expect them to deliver a lot if they're accountable for your major projects. You know, sometimes talking about large sums of money, large investments for an organisation, you know, however relative that is to, to what your, your uh, turnover is. 
And what is the point of doing that if you don't give these people time to think? You, you are paying for thinkers, you're paying for people who can lead, but that means they have to have time to think about what's appropriate in the situation. How can I manage a stakeholder? You don't manage a stakeholder effectively by having a, a, a one or two minute conversation with them. You need time to build relationships. So I think there are individual measures of what sufficient time is across what sponsors are doing, as opposed to, you know, you should only have one project, you should only have five, they should be this level of complexity, because in reality, projects are on the move the whole time. Well, while you're on a roll, um, Carol, uh, do you fancy dealing with this one? This question from Charles. How do you deal with a situation whereby the project organisation and its sponsor, as in requires the project outputs, is different to the delivery organisation, which may have different internal priorities? In other words, the sponsor does not directly own the delivery organisation. There we have it. I know you've got a view on that, Carol. Yes, yeah, so I think I'm just having a quick read of the question here. So. So we're not well, talking about we're not talking well, about outsourcing the project. We're talking about the sponsor being part of a different uh, sorry the delivery team being part of a different organisation. I, I think you you set yourself up for for failure when you put your organisation into silos with competing objectives. So if I think about an organisation where I was the sponsor and the delivery organisation worked on another part of the business and we had an opportunity um, to take a project forward but actually the business case no longer stood up. So I went to the project team and said, actually, business case doesn't stack up. The cost of delivering this is now double what the, the benefit to the business would be. So we have to look at an alternative solution. And the delivery organisation's response immediately was, well, we are actually measured on, on meeting our outturn and there's no way we can cancel projects. So immediately we got, an, and of course the project was cancelled, but immediately you're in really difficult situations where your incentives are not even aligned corporately and yet you're expected to deliver successful projects. Yeah, I, I would I would add on to that because you know coming from a contracting background where you know the delivery organization as a contractor was always separate from the, the owner organization. And for me, this is why the, the importance of having, I mean, I think it was model model four in the um, sponsoring change book, making sure that there is a sponsor and a project manager in the owner organization as well as a project manager doing the delivery in the contracting organisation and within that contracting organisation making sure that there's somebody in there that's that's sponsoring and accountable for at least the overall relationship with the client or the owner organisation and for the benefits because the worst thing being in a contracting organisation is where you start a project and the, the beginning of the project they say right you're the project manager martin oh by the way in winning this work we had to cut the budget by 10 percent so here's 10 percent of what you think you had as a budget to deliver it with now for me that is not the project manager's problem uh, if the business wants to cut the cut the price that it's selling the work at that's a, a biz, that's a sponsored decision in the contracting organization and the project manager shouldn't be held account for that because he's about delivery the issues about delivery. So I'm quite passionate about that one. That there, we need to make sure that you know where we've got an owner and a contractor, that the contractor has its own sponsor role that's responsible to the board. The project manager concentrates on delivery, but then that project manager also has a project manager in the owner organisation to to interface with, because then they're both focused on delivery. Because of course the owner organisation priorities may change, but that needs to come through proper governance. Yep, I agree. And, and that's, come back to John's earlier question, that, that's probably one of the pitfalls of if you've been a sponsor and you become a project manager, is that change in what is your relationship with the supply chain? So what, I was used to having a very direct relationship with people who were building things. So they were outside the organisation, but they were essentially tier one or two contractors. And actually, as a sponsor, my, my relationship was different from them. And I had to be really careful not to get in the way of the contract as well as the way of the relationships. And because I was used to immediately just lifting the phone and saying, how, how did things go this week? And that wasn't my role anymore. OK, I think we've got time for one last question. Let me just pick one up from Anita. What can PMO do to help sponsors contribute effectively in their role? Quite a lot is my, is my, um, is my response to that. I think first of all, PMO have got the, should have the ability to make sure there's some proper training in place, but they've definitely got the ability to start the conversation. And the conversation needs to start with, okay, so who's the sponsor on this project or program? Do we have clarity? Is it an individual? 
field do we have an executive sponsor do we have a delegated sponsor is it a group what what is it what are the benefits and who's going to be held accountable for them that starts the conversation going about making sure that there's at least clarity on who that is and then the question you then have is about okay so if there's training and the sponsors have been through some training what's their level of competence in doing the role can you help with that through training com com competence development or whatever but also making sure that the sponsors have proper um, performance objectives in their personal targets so you can get that clear line of delegation from the board down to delivery and the PMO should be all over this whether it's a program a portfolio whatever they should they should be all over that and ensuring the conversations happen so that there's some clarity and waving a red flag if there isn't Carol do you want to add to that um, so just to say that I agree with that and I also saw some work recently by a, a really good PMO and actually what they were doing is they were looking very carefully at the risk profile of every individual project, mapping it against what the sponsor competency was and also actually bringing a bit together their intuition as well as their information to say actually that sponsor has got four projects that are escalating gradually in risk so we need to look at this as perhaps something we send in more support or we start to move this around the portfolio and, and they were probably doing the most sophisticated job that I had seen of a PMO because they were actually then feeding that information back to the organisation to say he, here is how your portfolio is moving forward and here are the key risk areas and it's, it came a loss came across a lot stronger than the sponsor saying I'm busy or I've got all the difficult projects or I've got all the complexity or I need resource it, it made it very um made it very objective I have to say I was really impressed with the work they were doing and when I asked them how they had built up the process they said there is no process this is just the, the how we do the day job so I am actually would be quite keen to work with them a bit more to get some out of that that we can we can share actually with people because it was it was excellent work they were doing Okay, brilliant. Uh, so in summary, guys, um, you know, the sponsor role we're, we're saying is, is the crucial, critical role for project success. Um, boards, main boards and project managers have a responsibility to support sponsors. We've talked in, in the question and answers about ways that project managers can support sponsors. Yeah, the whole organisation needs to acknowledge and support and we need to be really clear who's the real sponsor, who's the executive sponsor, who's the delegated sponsor. Good practice is evolving. It's an immature game, this at the moment. So please, please do contribute. And as I said before, there are some good support resources available, both from the APM uh, website, sponsoring change uh, is available. There's other, there's other things which may will send around the list of resources available. So please keep contributing. Thank you very much for your time and please do get in touch with the governance if you've got any questions so thank you very much for your time today everyone